All right, I will open the gate now. All right. Hello, everyone. So I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people here. So we have 260 and counting from all over Asia. So hello, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. It's great to see everyone here in Swipe RxS webinar. And mind you that we are also live in YouTube. So the viewers there can also participate as long as you are in the seminar for at least 45 minutes. And you should be able to answer the evaluation form afterwards. I know everyone is excited to learn about the updates about the COVID-19 vaccination program across Asian countries. But before everything else, before anything else, just a few reminders. I will be your moderator for today. My name is Mikey Mendoza and I'm a community pharmacist from the Philippines. So just to remind you for our house rules, we will mute your microphones while the session is ongoing. You may submit your questions via Zoom question and answer box. You can see a chat box there, the Q&A box portion at your screen. You can place your questions there and the Q&A will follow right after the session. We will try to attend most questions within the given time. And in order to get the certificate, you need to attend the webinar for at least 45 minutes. The instructions for the issuance of certificates will be announced at the end of this session. So the number six, sit back, relax, and enjoy the webinar. Now, what's new in Swipe RX? Now, may I call on Ms. Ike to give us a few updates about the trending events on Swipe RX? All right. Thanks, Mikey, and good afternoon, everyone in across uh, of Indonesia, Philippines, Cambodia, Malaysia, and everyone from any other countries that is joining us today in a very um, interesting and lovely uh, afternoon. And uh, welcome, welcome again to the Swipe RX regional webinar. And for this edition, we are going to learn together about the uh, role of pharmacies, how we can contribute better to the uh, COVID-19 vaccination program in each of our respective countries, because what we want is the world to heal better and faster so that we can have what's so-called normal life, the beautiful life that we have before the virus is attacking the whole world. And um, SwibeRx is very grateful to have you today with us. As you know, SwibeRx are the largest pharmacy professional network in the Southeast Asia. So we are here to uh, deliver to you the best experience for uh, upgrading uh, your professional um, level, your professional expertise with our CPD modules. There are a lot of CPD modules that you can take uh, in all of our uh, countries, in all of our markets as well as also you can participate in our uh, projects that we work together with our public health um, uh, sectors, our partners, and you can also connect it with 
fellow pharmacy professional as well as having your training and to be having something more like this which is more upcoming webinar events so uh thank you once again for being here all with us um and uh please keep updated uh via your swipe rx uh, application because there are a lot of things that we can enjoy together and as a pharmacist we can contribute better to our society so by this um, we are going to start our regional webinar with the lovely speakers, the a very great expert from uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Cambodia, and the Philippines. And by this, thank you very much once again. I am delivering it back to Mikey. Take it over, Mikey. Thank you very much, Ms. I. Yes, so get more convenient experience by updating Swipe RX app to the App Store. It's available on Google Play as well as on the App Store and iPhone users. So we have four speakers all around Asia. Now let's dig in deeper to that. To introduce our first speaker from the Philippines, he is an alumnus of the University of Perpetual Health System, Dr. Jose G. Tamayo Medical University in Binyan, Laguna, where he obtained his bachelor's degree in pharmacy. A duly registered pharmacist, he pursued his master's degree in business administration at the International Academy of Management and Economics in Makati City. He is currently the president of the BYP Trading and Consultancy Services, providing consultancy to different pharmacy-related companies, startup tech companies, and other professional organizations. He is also a part-time lecturer at the University of Makati College of Allied Health Science Pharmacy section. Proving to be one of the most sought-after speakers in the pharmaceutical industry, his portfolio boasts of speakership and learning program development for top pharmaceutical companies such as Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, MSD, Pfizer, Viatris, Unilab, Brightman, and different pharmaceutical retail establishments. He is currently the Assistant Secretary of the Philippine Pharmacists Association, Incorporated. He is the immediate past president of the Asian Young Pharmacist Group and was one of the trailblazers in the earlier years of Young Pharmacist Group Philippines, with which he served as the second president. He is also a member of the Philippine Pharmacists Association Speakers Bureau, a pool of duly qualified and esteemed resource persons for different engagements across the country. Currently, he is also the chairman of Philippine Pharmacists Association Committee on Advocacy and the National Program Manager of the Philippine Pharmacists Association Immunizing Pharmacists Certification Program. Under his chairmanship, the training of pharmacists to be vaccinators is rolled out last March. This new role of pharmacists will pave the way for expanded role of pharmacists as healthcare professionals and will potentially change the landscape of the, of the profession. Let us all welcome Mr. Brian Posadas. Thank you so much, Mikey, for that uh, very uh, generous introduction. Allow me to share my screen. A pleasant afternoon to everyone, to our dear colleagues across Asia. It's always a privilege to uh, impart knowledge and some exciting things that is happening in the Philippines that hopefully would also encourage everyone to be more active in uh, expanding our role and our contribution in the deployment of COVID-19 vaccine. So let me start my presentation again in reminding us how important vaccine is. Again, as uh, mentioned by the World Health Organization, vaccine really brings us closer to protecting everyone against preventable diseases. This uh, pandemic has caused us a lot of uh, anxiety, uh, being away from our dear friends and being not able to uh, meet them, uh, spend time with them. But with vaccine, of course, we are expecting like how it is in other countries where they have already reached critical mass of vaccinated individuals. They have already restarted how they live life the way before it was pandemic. A vaccine activates our immune system without making us sick. And this is something that I have to remind everyone because most of the time people would think that vaccine is the cure or the treatment that we could use to stop this pandemic. But it actually helps our immune system. It is still our immune system that would fight off this infection. And that's the reason why this must be conveyed to the public. So it would alleviate uh, or, or address some misconceptions and some uh, 
some of them thinking that how come we're already vaccinated but we still tested positive of COVID. Again, it is not a force field that will not let you be infected. You can still be infected except that your immune system can actually fight it off and prevent any severe uh, infection or, or uh, problem. No? Many dangerous infectious diseases can be prevented in this simple and effective way. And we know vaccine has to prevent uh, its worth no, in combating infectious diseases. But the challenge is really in COVID-19 vaccines, the vaccination deployment, which all of us and most of the countries are experiencing are these four, the, the major challenges. There are a lot of challenges, but of course, the major challenges that we have to face day in, day out in the deployment of vaccination for COVID-19 is really on the availability of vaccines. We know there is a scarce supply of resources. That's why there is prioritization. But aside from the availability of vaccines, logistics or cold chain management is also a big challenge for all of us, considering that there are some vaccines that's even considered uh, that, that requires ultra cold storage where not all uh, states or countries would be able to handle and make sure that it does not have any cold chain breach. So logistics and cold chain management of this vaccine is also a challenge. Another thing is the demand generation. Not everyone would want to get vaccinated. There are a lot of anti-vaxxers that is going around our community. There is no country exempted of anti-vaxxers. There are a lot of anti-vaxxers. And this has been affecting the demand, uh, the demand for this vaccine. Again, we already have a problem for the availability of vaccine. And when your country already have the stocks, it is now the demand that becomes our problem. And another thing that we have to always consider here is the lack of human resources to administer COVID-19 vaccines. Again, we cannot just uh, rely to any non-healthcare professionals to administer vaccines. We need people, okay? Uh, because vaccines will not be administered directly to the patient without an intervention of a human. We need warm bodies. We need people who would administer this vaccine and get it into the system of every uh, uh every countryman uh, or, or, or our countrymen. Now, especially in the Philippines, really, there is a dramatic drop in vaccine confidence in the, uh, in the Philippines. Especially we came from a situation where there was uh, what we call dengue vaccine scare. A lot of people are afraid of vaccine. And from the experience of having a new vaccine for dengue with unproven, no, uh, uh, and doc, uh, no, no, uh, with, with some news that it causes harm to our patients, a lot of Filipinos would always think of what would happen considering that this all vaccine for COVID is also new. So basically, that there is a drop in the vaccine confidence in the Philippines. That's why there is a massive effort that we need to do to increase that vaccine confidence. We need to convey the message that despite of the shorter period of time used in the development of this COVID-19 vaccines, it is safe and it went through the protocols. For COVID-19 vaccines in the Philippines, it went down to a slow but 65%, but good enough. Uh, recently, we have roughly around 75% vaccine confidence uh, for COVID-19, but, uh, but these things must be addressed as well. Now, the question really for a pharmacist is how can we help? How can we help of all these challenges? We know there are challenges, but as, far as a pharmacist, as a healthcare professional, what can we do? How can we pitch in and help the healthcare community? Because you see, uh, in the Philippines, what we call, uh, we call it like a whole of nation approach, a whole of society approach. We cannot uh, live in an area where there is still strong turfism that we could, that we could not uh, set aside our differences and pitch in to help. We really have to pitch in to help to make sure that we get those vaccines into the patients. Now, this is the three main roles of the pharmacist that we are always embarking on or looking at in the Philippines as a, far as a vaccinator, as a facilitator, and as an advocate. Now, pharmacists as an advocate is very critical because pharmacists are strategically located in different uh, spectrum of our society, especially community pharmacies. We are where the patients is. And they are uh, talking to us, engaging us to buy their medications. If we are an advocate, we could also help address those misconceptions. Again, I would always say this, 
there will always be myths, but it can only be countered with facts. And if we remain silent of not telling them or not educating them, the, the, the fake news will continuously proliferate. So as a pharmacist, we have to continuously educate and motivate our patients to get those vaccines. We have to address those vaccine hesitancy, those uh, questions about vaccines. As a healthcare professional, as a pharmacist, we are positioned and knowledgeable about these things. Therefore, we must address it head on. We cannot avoid those questions about vaccines. We have to address those questions and we need to correct misconceptions. We always have to remember that we have to anchor on benefits versus risk. As we always say, pharmacists would always balance benefits versus risk. In the same way, in the vaccines, there may be some reported side effects or adverse events, but we have to measure the benefit. Does it outweigh the risk? And if it outweighs the risk, as a pharmacist, we should be responsible to advocate for immunization. When we say facilitator, this is other tasks that a pharmacist could do. We can help in, in different aspects in the vaccination rollout. In the Philippines, a pharmacist is involved even in the cold chain management, in the availability of supply, you know, uh, pharmacovigilance. Pharmacists are involved in all these aspects, in handling, preparing, reconstitu uh, reconstitution of these vaccines as may be needed. We, pharmacists are really in charge of making sure there is no cold chain breach. And this is one of the roles of the pharmacists in COVID-19 vaccination deployment. And all of these roles are critical. Again, we would always say in every, uh, in every role that we play in the entire COVID-19 vaccination deployment, all of it are important. We have to make sure that we are knowledgeable enough and we are ready to respond to the needs of our patients. And lastly, one of the newest that we are rolling out in the Philippines is that Filipino pharmacists are working as vaccinators. As I mentioned earlier, we know that there is a scarcity of human resources. Our doctors and our nurses are not enough to administer 140 million jobs. Uh, we have 103 pop uh, million population in the Philippines. We need at least 70% to reach herd immunity. So that's around 140 million jobs uh, or, or vaccinations. But looking at the number of medical professionals, nurses, and midwives, the, the physicians, the midwives, and uh, nurses, we know it's not enough. That's why we have to respond. Because as a healthcare professional, we know we can do this. Now, we know how to prepare the medicine. Much as, much as well, I don't know, uh, why not limit ourselves in not administering the vaccine. So we have to go and get that role. We have to train ourselves and get that role as a vaccinator to pitch in and help to make sure that we reach herd immunity as fast as we can. Now, there are some references that we could see to show the impact of pharmacists in vaccine uptake. We're talking about vaccination uptake in general. The role of pharmacists as a vaccinator is not entirely new in the Philippines. This has been ongoing to different countries. And uh, in the U.S., more than 32% of adults in the United States have reported receiving a flu vaccine from a drugstore or supermarket pharmacy. And based on the, on the news articles that we are also receiving, pharmacists in the community is very critical no? uh, and has contributed a lot in making sure that a lot of Americans get vaccinated. They just have to go to the pharmacy and get their vaccination shots. And this is why they're faster in, making, uh, in reaching their herd immunity. The United Kingdom also had vaccination way back in 2013, 2014, and we've been seeing significant numbers of patients getting their vaccines in their pharmacy. Also in Canada, vaccination rates in older people were increased in parts of the country where pharmacy vaccination clinics were introduced. The main vaccination routes in Canada are now at pharmacies, 35% followed by the doctor's office. I saw one, of, uh, one news article that showed the prime minister getting their vaccine shots in a pharmacy. You see, this is how critical a contribution of pharmacists is in the deployment of vaccination. In Australia, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, I think Australia, okay. Almost 15% of people who got vaccinated said they would not have taken the vaccination if the service had not been available in the pharmacy. In other countries, Ireland, Portugal, France, we've been seeing numbers increasing because pharmacists really 
is uh, a critical player in, in making sure that we get those vaccines to the patients. In Asia, uh, when we did our research, there is no Asian country that promulgated a law allowing the pharmacists to administer vaccines except the Philippines. The Philippines technically is the first Asian nation to legally permit pharmacists to vaccinate. We have law that uh, we hope could uh, really pave the way to this new professional service of pharmacists. RA-10918 of the Philippines has stated clearly as part of the role of the pharmacist, expanded role of pharmacists in the vaccination is really to administer adult vaccines, including prophylactic exposure uh, vaccines like your COVID-19. Aside from 10918, there is also an, uh, another law in the Philippines, it's RA11525, specifically for COVID-19 vaccination, that also allows pharmacists to be vaccinators. So basically, we have all the legal means, no? the legal mandate given by the state to expand the role of the pharmacist and help the community. We push for its urgent implementation, and that's the reason why the Philippine Pharmacists Association, being the national organization of pharmacists, were able to roll out the training program for the pharmacists. Ideally, it should be PPHA providing, providing the training and then will be certified by the Professional Regulation Commission. However, because of the urgency of the matter at hand to make sure that COVID-19 deployment is done as fast as we can, vaccination deployment is done as fast as we can, the Board of Pharmacy has accredited the Philippine Pharmacists Association and already requires the PPHA to issue the certification, which is already the proof of the eligibility of the pharmacists to administer adult vaccines. So basically, when a pharmacist was trained by the National Organization of Pharmacists, the program that I'm running, they are already legally allowed to administer vaccines. Now, this is what we're doing in the Philippines. To help in the COVID-19 vaccination deployment, aside from our usual roles in the supply chain, the Philippine Pharmacists Association launched the Immunizing Pharmacy Certification Program last April 5, 2021. And to date, we have 143 fully certified immunizing pharmacists and almost 400 are undergoing their training. Again, the training that we're providing now already includes all adult vaccines, uh, that can be administered in the pharmacy pattern on how our Western friends are also doing it. This is part of our IPCT team. Most of them are our assessors. And some of you may be thinking, how are we providing the training? We have to do it hybrid. Now, there is an online part, there is a self-study part, and there is also a face-to-face -face assessment that has to be done to ensure that the skills were developed with the pharmacist. And this is how we expand. Now, this is part of different batches of pharmacists being trained using this same platform as Zoom, except that there are also supervised uh, skills assessment online. So uh, basically, this is how we're providing the training. Much as we want to make it a face-to-face -face training program, especially we're talking about skills, we have to be innovative. So for the concepts, for the theories, we have to make it online. But there is just one part in the latter part of the program where there should be a face-to-face -face assessment with a proctor. So basically, these are the team, the, uh, these are the batches of pharmacists. We have ongoing now, uh, it's batch five, we have 102 far participants. And all of these 102 participants is coming from a chain drug store in the Philippines. We will be launching uh, another batch, batch six on July 5, where we are expecting another 100 plus pharmacists being trained to be immunizers. And just to share with our colleagues in Asia, uh, even the government really has already embraced and uh, is very uh, optimistic and happy having the pharmacists as part of the vaccination team as a vaccinator, beside, uh, aside from the role, typical role in the supply chain. And these are some of the immunizing Filipino pharmacists in action. They are already administering the shots. Uh, the one here on the left, if I'm not mistaken, is Irish. She's also with us as part of the panelists of Swipe RX. She is also a certified immunizing pharmacist. And we have other pharmacists here uh, who are also administering already adult vaccines. So this is where we are going and we will continuously go to make sure that the pharmacies are felt. Now, some of you may be thinking, why do we have to push for immunizing pharmacists? Why do we have to push for additional service? You and I know that before this pandemic, a lot of our community 
would always perceive pharmacists as a glorified salesperson, just a shop uh, seller. No, uh, They are not considering us as healthcare professional. If there is a time for us to step up and show them that, hey, we are healthcare professionals, we can help you, the time is now. The time is now for the, for the community to realize that pharmacists has a critical role and could help us get away of this pandemic and heal the world faster. We need to embrace that role. And that's why in the Philippines, we are strongly pushing for this new service because we know sooner or later, the services of the pharmacists would change. We will not be, uh, we should not rely on merely dispensing because sooner or later, technology could come in. Technology could take over some of those clerical roles that we're doing. We need to provide services and we need to put an avenue for them to realize that they can get more from a pharmacist. And because we are in a crisis, we, live this, we believe that this is an era of change where future starts. And as I end my discussion very briefly uh, this afternoon, because we have a lot of uh, credible speakers as well with us, in the midst of every crisis lies great opportunity. We may be through, going through some tough times, but to heal the world faster, we need to stand up and pitch in and make our contribution felt. We have to get out of our comfort zone because during this time of crisis, the country, our, our country depends on us more. Changing landscape in pharmacy profession is inevitable. We have to move into the services because again, technology might take us over. We have to go to the services where there is no technology available and we need to let our presence be felt by the community. And we always believe that the time to pivot is now. We have to heal the country fast. We have to heal the world fast. We need to show them that pharmacists can make a contribution. Thank you so much and have a nice day. Thank you very much, Sir Brian, no, um, for explaining us the different roles of pharmacists, especially now in the COVID-19 pandemic. Now we have facilitators, we have vaccinators, and as well as also the initiative to have um, pharmacists as vaccinators in the Philippines, which is uh, I, I personally can see that it's very, very fast. Um, the training is very, very fast and all, almost the number of being con uh, of vaccinators being confirmed is increasing by the day. No? So once again, thank you very much, Sir Brian, for that very, very uh, knowledgeable lecture that you've gave, given us. Now for our second speaker from Malaysia, he graduated his bachelor's degree in University Saints, Malaysia, finished his PhD in pharmacy in the University of Tennessee, United States, and undergone a certificate program in global tobacco control at the John Hopkins University, John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He is currently head of Kulia of Pharmacy. He is also the chairman of the Malaysian Pharmacy Society Immunization Chapter. He also serves as supervisor for postgraduate researchers. He also co-authored several publications, one about the prevalence, pattern, and perception regarding e-cigarette and vape, of, vape use among Malaysian adults. Let us all welcome Professor Muhammad Hanike Bin Nick Muhammad. Thank you so much, Menki. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, SwipeRx, and all of you who have joined us today. Um, it's actually in the afternoon time uh, in Malaysia. It's a great opportunity to share uh, regarding COVID-19 uh, in particular, uh, the antivirals agents uh, involved in the uh, management of COVID-19. This is the topic given to me. So uh, let me try and share the screen. Okay, so I'm representing um, both the uh, International Islamic University of Malaysia and also the Malaysian Pharmacist Society Immunization Advocacy Chapter. So uh, thank you to uh, Brian and also um, my deepest appreciation to uh, the other speakers as well. Um, of course, very inspiring talk by Brian just now. So uh, we hope that we'll embark in Malaysia the same program. We have a similar program called uh, certification uh, for pharmacists as uh, uh, vaccinators as well. 
but I will share that on another platform because the assigned topic for me is talking about antiviral to prevent further spread and prompt treatment of COVID-19 uh, patients. Okay. So I will be uh, highlighting the life cycles of uh, SARS-CoV-2 and the potential drug targets. And I will zoom in into the drug uh, information uh, for COVID-19 um, pertaining to the antivirals. I know it's a busy slide, it's pharmacology uh, back again, but we know that um, to start off to understand the antivirals uh, agents for um, SARS-CoV-2, we need to understand a bit about the uh, genome that encodes for the 29 proteins involved in the infection, replication, and also virion assembly process. Uh, because like other coronaviruses, uh, we know that SARS-CoV-2 are characterized by the presence of the crown-like spikes on the surface. And this the spike S protein from the SARS-CoV-2 -CoV contains the receptor binding domain that binds to the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 and thereby promotes uh, membrane fusion and also uptake of the virus into human cells by uh, endocytosis. So the receptor binding domain or RBD pre uh, present in the spike protein is the most variable region of the coronavirus genome. Structural and biochemical studies have suggested that the uh, receptor binding domain from SARS-CoV-2 binds with the high affinity to uh, ACE2 compared to other SARS-CoV-2 uh, COVID viruses. Okay, however, the human ACE2 protein variability may also be a factor for the high binding affinity. And the life cycle of SARS-CoV-2 and the potential drug targets as shown here in the diagram would then uh, highlight the fact that SARS-CoV-2 enters target cells via two uh, methods either via endosomes or plasma membrane fusion, um, or I mean via endosomes or plasma membrane fusion. So in both ways, spike proteins S1 or S2 mediate attachment to the cell membrane by binding to the S2 receptor. And then in the endosomal, via spike proteins are activated by capsin L or alternatively by transmembrane protease serine 2 in close proximity to S2 receptor which then initiates fusion of the viral membrane with the plasma membrane. Viral RNA is then released and part is translated to produce uh, polyproteins PP1A and PPAB, which are then cleaved by proteases okay, to yield the 16 non-structural proteins that form the RNA replicase transcriptase complex. This complex drives the production of the negative sense RNAs through both replication and transcription. A subset of around nine subgenomic RNAs, including those encoding all structural proteins, are translated. And then viral nucleocapsids are assembled from genomic RNA and N protein in the cytoplasm, followed by budding into lumen of endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi complex. And lastly, virions are released through exocytosis. So sorry for the detail, but all these six processes are relevant because then we know where the potential uh, SARS-CoV-2 targets and the drugs are as shown in red. The drugs and the treatment strategies investigated definitely aim to inhibit viral entry or replication into human cells, avoid cytokine storm or decrease hyperinflammation and also lung injury. Okay. So these are the summary of the possible modes of action of antiviral agents for COVID-19. What do we have? We know these are some of the antivirals and also some repurposed drugs uh, with antiviral activities against the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we know about remdesivir, papipiravir, lopinavir, ritonavir combination and other HIV protease inhibitors, the use of hydrochloroquine or chloroquine with or without azithromycin. I will just briefly touch on those because they are no longer warranted. Uh, very controversial, uh, ivermectin and some other new agents in um, studies. Okay, so for the first uh, two antiviral agents shown here, the RNA dependent uh, RNA polymerase inhibitor, we have remdesivir and favipravir. So the details are 
in uh, this slide. I do not wish to go through very, in very detail. Uh, it would take too much time. Just to highlight uh, the um, mechanism of action, the dosing regimen, uh, contraindication, some of the adverse effects uh, also shown here and then some drug interactions. They, this information would be useful for pharmacists, particularly hospital pharmacists uh, in dealing with uh, COVID-19 patients. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. For the protease inhibitors, we have lopinavir, ritonavir at the bottom part of the slide. Okay. And uh, similarly with uh, Previous drugs, you have the MOA, or mechanism of action, the dosing regimen, the contraindication adverse effects, and also some drug interactions, particularly the effect of the cytochrome 3A4 uh, inhibition and also induction. The nucleoside inhibitors are listed here, okay, but um, not much, not, um, uh, the agents are not used uh, in particular for COVID-19, it's just for completeness sake, uh, I've listed them down as related to the mechanism of action uh, as similar to previous drugs, okay? Also, you have neuroamidase inhibitor, uh, nucleoside inhibitor, okay, listed here, and also polymerase acidic endonuclease inhibitors, okay? So I will just zoom into uh, remdesivir, which was the first FDA-approved antiviral for the management of COVID-19. Um, if you look at the uh, US National Institute of Health uh, treatment guidelines, it's still listed uh, remdesivir for hospitalized adult and pediatric patients, uh, whether they are mechanically ventilated or not, uh, in terms of dosing regimen, um, uh, duration of treatment, and so on and so forth. Okay. Similarly, the adverse effects and the monitoring parameters uh, in relation to um, safety and efficacy are listed, as well as the role of the pharmacist to ensure um, uh, safety and uh, effectiveness of the drug by also trying to avoid drug-related problems, including drug-drug interactions, uh, actual or potential. And then you also have... Um, information that you would be uh, useful for you uh, as particularly uh, hospital pharmacists uh, looking at evidence for uh, the particular drug and, and in this case in remdesivir uh, for the clinical trials which is um, readily obtained from uh, the link provided uh, for example from the NIH. Okay. Of course, we initially heard about the use of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, and uh, after some time, and also Cochrane uh, has uh, published the review, and we know that there's no clinical benefit in treating COVID-19 uh, patients with hydroxychloroquine. Um, in fact, there's a possible increase in adverse events. Um, in the evidence for prevention is still very uncertain and due to the lack of benefit, there's little or no um, evidence on clearance of, of the virus. So uh, it's probably, uh, it's actually um, no longer recommended. Okay. And we have the uh, lack of demonstrable clinical benefit in treatment of COVID-19, as well as no trials uh, in terms of the use of hydroxychloroquine for prophylaxis and evidence for hydroxychloroquine uh, effective as prophylaxis also uh, limited, okay, and due to uh, limited effectiveness and was, uh, increase in adverse effects, so it was not um, recommended. Recently, in February uh, this year, that's uh, the WHO Solidarity Trial Consortium um, that looked into uh, different uh, agents, including antivirals for management of COVID-19 and supposedly with antiviral activity, and this would include the remdesivir and also the combination of pinavir. So hydroxychloroquine um, also um, reviewed as well as interferon, and all of these are compared uh, to controls. So you can see from the Kaplan-Meier graphs that um, uh, overall effects, yeah, when they look at the 405 hospitals in 30 countries involving 11,330 adults who underwent randomization, about 2,750 assigned to receive remdesivir, 
954 to hydroxychloroquine, um, 1411 to lopinavir without interferon, and 263 to interferon, uh, including 651 patients uh, randomized to interferon plus lopinavir, and 4,088 to no, uh, no trial drug. Uh, very good adherence around four, uh, 94 to 96, uh, midway to treatment with two to 6% crossover. And in total, 1,253 deaths were reported. And the 28 mortality from the Kaplan-Meier plot was 11.8%, 39% if the patient was already receiving ventilation at randomization and 9.5% otherwise. Death actually occurred in 301 of the 2,743 uh, 2, patients receiving remdesivir, and in 303 of 2,008 receiving control, giving a rate ratio of 0 0.95 with confidence interval of 0 0.81 to 1.11. P-value 0 0.5, not significant. In 104 of 947 patients receiving hydroxychloroquine, as you can see there, and in 84 uh, of 906 receiving its control, rate ratio is 1.19, okay? Confid confidence interval 0 0.89 to 1.59, P 0 0.23. And in 148 of 1,399 patients receiving lopinavir, and in 146 of 1,373 receiving control, the rate ratio is 1. Confidence interval 0 0.79 to 1.25. P-value is also not significant, 0 0.97. Okay. Um, I just, for completeness sake, we'll go through the uh, interferon, which is 243 of 2,050 patients. And in 2016 of 2,050 receiving control, the rate ratio is 1.16. Confidence interval 0.96 to 1.39. So all this data concludes that no, no drug definitely reduced mortality overall or in any subgroup or reduced initiation or ventilation or hospitalization duration. But you can look at the lower part of this um, plot, uh, the risk groups calculated by summation of uh, relevant strata. You can see the uh, Patient at lower risk, yeah, straight up with no uh, ventilation, you can see that the confidence interval is uh, 0 0.63 to 1.01 .01 favoring remdesivir, although it's not uh, significant, but uh, maybe in some part of the uh, world, the use of uh, remdesivir in low risk patient um, is based on this data. Um, we know that some countries are using it, okay? But in Malaysia, um, we have another um, antiviral yeah, that is used, favipiravir. Uh, so it's used in uh, category three of patients, okay? As you, uh, in Malaysia, uh, the clinical stage uh, is divided into five stages, where one is asymptomatic, two symptomatic but no pneumonia, three symptomatic with pneumonia, four clinical stage is symptomatic pneumonia requiring supplemental uh, oxygen, and the clinical stage five is when patients are critically ill with multi-organ uh, involvement, okay? So uh, the patients are treated with favipiravir, uh, category four, if patient has any of the following risk factors, uh, at least 50 years old with comorbidity and stage renal failure, and also in the pre uh, presence of any warning signs. Okay, which um, so the dosing is uh, 1,800 milligram BD for one day and followed by 800 milligram BD for five days. Although the optimal duration of antiviral treatment is still unknown, so that um, and then the the drug is uh, can be considered to be stopped or not initiated in hyperinflammatory phase of the disease, which is, uh, if you follow the COVID-19 natural history, uh, stage one is early infection, stage two is pulmonary phase, where there's viral replication, uh, lungs uh, affected, there's pneumonia, dyspnea, chest x-ray opacities, and on CT, there's uh, glass opacities. 
but in stage three, that's where the hyperinflammatory phase, and there's a host inflammatory response with pneumonia, sepsis, respiratory failure, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and of course, the cytokine storm that uh, causes increased risk of death. So for the pavipiravir, the uh, it cannot be used in uh, women of childbearing potential, uh, teratogenicity effect. So not for pregnant uh, patients or uh, breastfeeding patient. And the use of contraception is what pharmacists need to be um, uh, alerted to for the patients. Um, avoiding the, the use in uh, patients with renal impairment of estimated uh, GFR less than 30 minutes per minute. And of course, consultation is needed if patient on regular dialysis and the, uh, the listed common side effects are uh, hyperuricemia, diarrhea, elevated transaminases and neutropenia. And of course, some completeness uh, on the drug interaction information. Okay, so for the um, controversial ivermectin, okay, we know that um, from this diagram, uh, we know earlier from reports of in vitro studies, which suggested that ivermectin acts by inhibiting the host importin alpha or beta 1 nuclear transport proteins, which are part uh, of a key intracellular transport process that viruses hijack to enhance infection by suppressing the host antiviral response. Ivermectin acts by docking. Uh, and this may interfere with the attachment of the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 spike protein to the human cell membrane. Some studies of ivermectin have also reported potential anti-inflammatory properties which have been postulated to be beneficial in people with COVID-19. Okay, and of course, um, there have been at least 55 studies uh, as per data on 16 May 2021, and looking at early treatment uh, and late treatment, um, showing uh, some effects, some improvement um, uh, in terms of ivermectin. Okay, however, um, results from adequately powered, well designed, and well conducted clinical trials are still needed. Uh, to provide more specific evidence-based guidelines on the role of ivermectin in the treatment of COVID-19. Uh, I know that in the Philippines, uh, just recently um, approved to be prescribed by uh, physicians. Um, so uh, we hope that more data of good quality will come out soon, uh, particularly from uh, randomized control trial. Uh, uh, Malaysia is also currently undergoing a clinical trial for ivermectin. So we hope that the result will be available before year end, uh, expected in September. So we'll see whether Malaysia will also follow suit uh, in terms of the use of ivermectin. Okay, however, uh, some other drugs like molnupiravir, which is the pro-drug of the ribonucleoside analog, okay, uh, of beta dn hydroxycytidine which is rapidly converted in the plasma to uh, N-hydroxycytidine and then to the active 5' triphosphate formed by the host kinases. The active form serves as a competitive substrate for the virally encoded RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And once incorporated into nascent viral RNA, induces an antiviral effect via accumulation of mutations that increase with each viral replication cycle. So the, uh, there's been some trial, which is uh, listed here. Phase 2A, uh, which evaluated the safety, tolerability, and antiviral efficacy of molnupiravir in the treatment of COVID-19, and uh, tested 202 participants, found that virus isolation was significantly lower in participants who received 800 milligram molnupiravir versus placebo at day three, okay? And at day five, virus was no, no longer isolated from any participants who received 400 to 800 milligram of molnupiravir versus 11.1% of those receiving placebo. Okay, both of these results uh, at day three and day five were clinically significant. Uh, time to viral clearance was also decreased and a greater proportion overall achieved clearance in participants who were administered 800 milligram molnupiravir versus placebo. Uh, it was concluded that uh, molnupiravir was generally well tolerated 
with similar number of adverse effects across the groups, particularly headaches and diarrhea. Okay. Um, last but not least, a randomized double-blind sponsor open placebo controlled single and multiple dose escalation study in healthy adults evaluating the safety, tolerability, and pharmacokinetics of uh, this drug, FPF07321332, which is an oral antiviral protease inhibitor, which has been reported to have potent antiviral activity in vitro. And they started the phase one trial uh, in March this year. Uh, as well as another intravenous drug from the same company, uh, another protease inhibitor in phase uh, 1b multi-dose trial in hospitalized clinical trial participants with COVID-19. So we hope to have uh, more data and more studies uh, particularly soon because ongoing research and also pharmacovigilance of existing drugs, uh, particularly antivirals for uh, COVID-19 management, management is definitely required. And there's the definite role of pharmacists uh, in this uh, area. Antivirals for prevention and treatment, particularly to be used at home by people who are tested positive for infection and also to stop the virus spreading and speed up recovery time are definitely crucial and we can understand that it is in the pipeline and we hope that the results will be positive so that uh, we can overcome the uh, pandemic uh, in the near future. Uh, of course, right now, pharmacists can uh, also apply the power of knowledge on antiviral drugs to ensure good quality data on effectiveness and safety of COVID-19 management. With that, I thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Nick, for the scientific explanation of different medications that are and were used for the treatment of COVID-19. Thank you very much, Professor. Now, once again, I will remind all the participants here to don't forget to stay in this program for 45 minutes in order for you to have your certificates. Once again, please attend this webinar for at least 45 minutes for you to have avail your certificates at the end of the session. All right. To proceed to our third speaker from Indonesia, she graduated her bachelor's degree in the Universitas Pajajaran. She is currently the CEO of West Java Development Institute, Universitas Pajajaran, the chairperson for Indonesian Pharmacy Collegium, the chairperson for the COVID-19 Task Force Indonesian Pharmacists Association. She is the head of the Medication Therapy Adherence Clinic Faculty of Pharmacy, Universitas Pajajaran. An independent commissioner of PT Prodia Wija Hosada, a fellow of Academic Health System from the Universitas Pajajaran and a member of the National Commission on Herbal Medicine. Let us all welcome Professor Dr. Kerry Lestari. Okay, thank you, Mikey. And then uh, also thank you for the invitation from Swipe LX, uh, who organized this uh, event uh, very good, uh, especially facing the uh, challenging in vaccination uh, in Indonesia and also around Asia. Um, allow me to share my screen. Okay, as I have the term of reference from the committee, I will present my presentation about the role of pharmacists in Indonesia in bridging the gap in the public knowledge about COVID-19 vaccine uh, option. Uh, I'm Kerry Lestari from the Pharmacology and Clinical Department, Universitas Pajajaran Indonesia, and also from the Center of Excellence of Higher Education for Pharmaceutical Care Innovation of uh, Indonesia. And also I'm from the Ikatan Apotek Indonesia or Indonesian uh, Pharmacists Association. Indonesia now facing for the mass uh, vaccination uh, to build the heart immunity for the Indonesian community facing the pandemic of uh, COVID-19. As we know, uh, we are almost one year has a, a, a 
pandemic of COVID-19. Now in Indonesia also, uh, now is facing for 70% uh, of uh, vaccination in Indonesia. This uh, very uh, ambitious, uh, challenging for Indonesian country with the biggest number of um, one of the biggest number of population in Asia. And as we know, uh, we are facing of the rules of pharmacy in the implementation of vaccination, not just as a, a quite. Uh, maybe as a rare uh, or as a regular uh, role of pharmacies, but also we have facing the challenging uh, roles of pharmacy in terms of the vaccination. As we know, Indonesia now has declared there is some six uh, vaccine who uh, the six the six vaccine which will be as a uh, uh, providing vaccine in Indonesia. Uh, consists of the vaccine of PT Bio Pharma of uh, our uh, vaccine industry in Indonesia, and also from the AstraZeneca, Sinopharm, Moderna, Pfizer, and Sinopharm. As we know, the rules of pharmacy here to produce and to uh, provide the good quality of vaccine include a quality of um, uh, assurance from the product of vaccine. In um, policy of the Indonesian government, every, every vaccine which will be used in Indonesia must be validated and must be uh, has a has a coordination with PT Bio Pharma, and also must be have the emergency use of authorization from BPOM, the National Drug Agency of uh, Indonesia. We're facing about the vaccine distribution because mostly the vaccine has the cold supply chains. This is the rules also the, of the pharmacist to has a take um, uh, as, a, as a central roles in the distribution of vaccine. Why? Because the cold supply chains need the uh, competition of the pharmacist to hold all the distribution on the good hands. So the quality of vaccine will be clarified during the distribution. And then uh, we see uh, from the rules of the, uh, of the pharmacies also in Indonesia is uh, including in research and development of the vaccine. Many of pharmacies in Indonesia has involved in the research and development of vaccine. The director of operational of uh, the operational director of uh, PT Bio Pharma is the vaccine company of Indonesian uh, state-owned government uh, state-owned company is from also the pharmacist too, and then also uh, not just for the research and development and also for the manufacture and also uh, hub distribution. That's all is the rules of pharmacies for. Uh, take the vaccine on a good hands and then become uh, provide to the, the primary healthcare to deliver to the patient. And then also we need to make sure about the vaccine management in the healthcare uh, facility. We see that, um, um, uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm got the wrong, uh, the wrong presentation. Uh, allow me to change the, the uh, PowerPoint. I'm sorry. Ini salah, ini si Irma. Sorry about the wrong presentation. I will... Okay, it's okay, ma'am. While you are <laughs> doing that, yeah. uh, let me just remind all the participants that you have okay. to stay for the whole seminar within uh, at least at least 45 minutes for you to have your certificates be given. Once okay. again, you have to stay in this webinar for at least 45 minutes for you to have your certificates. Okay, yes. Yeah. Mm, I will close one. Okay. 
sorry okay I try to find okay okay this is the right one <laughs> because the last one is I'm right in the Bahasa and uh, the vaccine storage temperature is depend of the brand Sinovac AstraZeneca and Sinopharm need to uh, distribute in two until eight uh, Celsius degrees so uh, this is the rules of pharmacy to make sure about the uh, temperature of storage and distribution. Why? Because if the distribution not in those uh, temperatures, so the quality of vaccine is not in the good one, and then uh, we're afraid that the compatibility and the effectiveness of the vaccine has this uh, has a disturbance because uh, any kind of some uh, maybe uh, not in the proper distribution. The storage space also must be protected from direct sunlight. And then vaccine storage for healthcare facilities, they do not yet have the standard, which they do not have the standard vaccine refrigerator. As uh, we know of the uh, WHO pre-qualification can still use uh, with the domestic or, or household refrigerator. These three brand can also uh, allow to use the uh, household refrigerator. Why? Because the temperature is matched with the household refrigerator. Maybe th this is one of the advantages of this true, uh, these three brand of the uh, vaccination. And then where the arrangement of vaccine is carried out based on the classification of sensitivity of the temperature and according to effective vaccine management. The effective vaccine management is also uh, on the pharmacist uh, regulatory. Vaccines also should not be placed in the near the evaporator. And next brand is Moderna. Moderna storage temperature or distribu distribution is minus 20 degrees Celsius. Also the storage space must, uh, must be protected from direct sunlight. And then if there is um, maybe a little bit difficult to, the, to find the refrigerator uh, with this temperature, minus 20 uh, degrees Celsius, we can also use the refrigerator like uh, like the uh, previous uh, brand, but if we storage in uh, two uh, two until eight degrees Celsius, so uh, the vaccine uh, can last for thirty days. Uh, there is maybe uh, some uh, obstacles to use the Moderna in some uh, development countries with limitation about the refrigerator uh, who has uh, who meet the requirement for the uh, Moderna vaccine uh, distribution. And then also uh, Pfizer. Pfizer uh, can be distributed on the storage temperature minus 70 uh, degrees uh, Celsius. The storage type of uh, uh, vaccine uh, Pfizer uh, COVID-19 requires ultra uh, cold chain or UCC facilities. Storage space might be protected from direct sunlight. The UCC facilities is uh, is maybe have the uh, also uh, wants to have the ultra low temperature or ULT freezer and special vaccine transport. Uh, transportation equipment. This is the challenges for the distribution of the Pfizer, and then it it needs also uh, the pharmacist to hold this uh, distribution uh, on the right temperature. UCC vaccine transportation equipment is from the FASIP containers. Consists two uh, two kind of the uh, two kind of the of the things of the uh, containers, then the Arctic using cold box in, in the form of PGM or faster change materials and also ter uh, thermosipper using dry ice. PGM and dry ice function to maintain the cold temperatures, uh, make sure in the minus 70 uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, after distribution, after distribution, also we need uh, pharmacists uh, in the rules of monitoring and handling of adverse event after COVID-19 vaccination. In Indonesia, cold 
uh, or Indonesia name namely is Kifi. Kifi is uh, or Kipi. Kipi uh, Kifi is a uh, uh, komite Indo uh, komite Indonesia untuk uh, pasca vaksinasi. Yeah. Uh, I think record uh, the Kivi is uh, recording the re and reporting and also investigation of follow up events after uh, COVID-19 vaccination. And we see that the communication and education about vaccination to the public is also one of the big rules of the pharmacy. Why many of uh, uh, population maybe has some some kind of afraid or hesitancy about the vaccination. As we know, in every vaccination, there is some hesitancy population for the vaccine. But in terms of pandemic, the hesitancy population need to be has uh, included in the vaccination. Why? Because it is not just vaccination by themselves, but also it is vaccination for the safety of uh, herd immunity or the safety of the community. So uh, in terms of the pandemic, the numbers of population is uh, one of the aim to get the heart, uh, heart immunity for the population. So the, the aim of the communication and education about vaccination to the public by the pharmacists is to increase public understanding about COVID-19 vaccination. The vaccination is not just for uh, the safety of by uh, themselves, but also the vaccination is to build the herd immunity for the population or for the community. And also equip the public with accurate and correct information to avoid misinformation or hoaxes. Many hoaxes uh, nowadays in Indonesia uh, occur in, 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 in many events, also in some, uh, in some uh, social media that maybe can misleading about the information of the vaccine and also make some like a, a negative view about the vaccine. And then also the communication and education needs to increase community and stakeholder participation in the implementation of uh, COVID-19 vaccination and also to increase the public willingness to get uh, the COVID-19 vaccination. But uh, nowadays in Indonesia, the public willingness to get the COVID-19 vaccination is good enough. And then uh, we are now facing for uh, 10 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine that already uh, arrived in Indonesia this week. But after we have the vaccination, don't forget to still have the discipline in uh, to still have the discipline to uh, make sure uh, to wearing masks, physical distancing, and also uh, get your hands uh, clean. Why? Because the vaccine is not enough because the numbers of vaccine in Indonesia is still uh, not in the range of uh, safety. I think the numbers of, of vaccination in Indonesia is just only uh, around five to ten percent of population in Indonesia. So the strategic is still on uh, three angle that uh, such uh, such as the vaccination, 3M. 3M is a, a, a public attitude to wear masks, physical distancing, and also keep your hands clean, and then also uh, test, trace, and treatment. Uh, there, there is some um, uh, three strategic to uh, maybe to, to decline the numbers of pandemic in Indonesia. And then uh, as, we, as we mentioned before, that vaccination is not just for themselves, but also for the safety of uh, country and also the safety of the world. Why? Because uh, none of the uh, country uh, nowadays can be as um as um uh, just uh, thinking about the country but thinking about the human being all over the world and then due to the uh, uh, mass vaccination that we are arranged for Indonesia we see the proportion of the health workers in Indonesia uh, 
the number of um, doctors, uh, uh, the number of the, the doctors, and then the number of the nurse, I think uh, the composition is still um, has a challenging for the mass uh, vaccination. So there is some some rules in Indonesia that auto authorize a person to vaccination. Uh, this is a uh, goes to the doctor and midwife. So the authority of midwives and, and midwives and, and nurse, it's also possible that health services performed by midwives or nurse are carried out outside their authority due to delegation of authority. So I think with this uh, mechanism, no, pharmacists in Indonesia are facing the challenges to also has um, uh, take a part as a vaccinator that uh, already our uh, friend of pharmacists in Philippines already has the authority to, to become as the vaccinator. Uh, this week's the EIE or Indonesian uh, Association of Pharmacists also discuss about the possibility of pharmacists become the vaccinator in Indonesia due to the needs of a vaccinator that we need to have some uh, mass vaccination on the uh, tight uh, time. Why? Because the numbers of vaccine that already arrived in Indonesia also limited time in in uh, expired. So that's why uh, the the time to have the vaccinated to the people also is still limited. It means the medical act. Uh, it means that if the medical action in the form uh, of giving drugs or injection is beyond of the authority of maid, wife or nurse, but they are given the delegation, uh, then it is not prohibited. That's why uh, maybe the same kind of this uh, methodology can be used by the pharmacy for the vaccinator. As already discussed before with the previously uh, presenter, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Brian Santos, that also already mentioned that many country also uh, give the authority to the pharmacist to have the vaccinator by train also, by train of course, yeah. So FIP also released the vaccination services guidelines for the pharmacies. This is the best, uh, the, the best uh, our uh, activity for uh, for uh, vaccination. I, I mean, this is the uh, our um, best evidence for the uh, activity for the pharmacist as a vaccinator. Why? Because our association in global FIP also released the vaccination services guidelines for by the pharmacist. The guideline also can be used for the uh, training or for, or for the pharmacist to get the, uh, the competency uh, for vaccinator. FIP, uh, FIP strongly believes that pharmacists should be involved in vaccination strategies in many rules around the world, not just as um, uh, not just as a distribution, a distributor, and also not just as the production, but also can be as a um, uh, vaccinator uh, to the patient, and has given high priority to this area for a decade. In recent years. The number of countries that have introduced vaccinator or vaccination by pharmacies or community pharmacies has increased. That already mentioned by, by Professor Brian before. However, barriers and oppositions uh, to this uh, broadening of the scope of the pharmacist practice uh, still exist in many countries like in Indonesia also. And with these resources, we want to ins uh, inspire these countries to uh, move forward uh, and individuals uh, to act. So the, the authority comes to the pharmacist who has already trained or who has already certified as a vaccinator. Uh, and then also we see the data summary from a uh, global survey here that many country here has uh, also the numbers uh, of uh, vaccinator administration from the pharmacies. We see that um, from the uh, uh, on Australia also, and then uh, Canada, 
and then Denmark, they already uh, give the authority to pharmacy to become as the vaccinator uh, admi or, or yeah, as the vaccinator administration to the patient. Also, we see from uh, Philippines that uh, Professor Bain already, already uh, present, or also Portugal, Spain, uh, Switzerland, and then United Kingdom and United States of America is all, also have the uh, give the authority uh, for uh, vaccinator uh, administration. And uh, this is the data sum, uh, summary for global survey uh, that uh, according to WHO regions uh, for income group or OECD membership that we see the total number of uh, income group and total number of the vaccination has related. And then the rules of pharmacy in the implementation of vaccination by trainee is still unprepared in Indonesia. Hopefully, uh, they also have the support by other healthcare uh, professional uh, with the spirit to uh, accelerate it, the numbers of uh, patients who already, or the number of the uh, population that will be enhanced uh, in the number of the heart immunity that get by the population. Though, in spite of that, also, the rules of the pharmacies uh, in vaccination or in, in handled the uh, pandemic of COVID-19 also used by the Internet of Things as a media for information and communication. As we know, we have the limitation, uh, limitation or to have the face-to-face -face, uh, meeting. So the meeting like now, it is more effective and more safety by using the media of uh, uh, Internet of Things and also uh, like Zoom, like also uh, Gmail and everything uh, that we can still have uh, communication face-to-face uh, -face without uh, uh, offline meeting. And then Indonesia, also Ikatan Apoteker Indonesia, IAI, or Indonesian Association of Pharmacies, and then uh, my university, Universitas Pajajaran, Faculty of Pharmacy Universitas Pajajaran, uh, develop the Internet of Things or the application uh, apps to, uh, uh, to as a um, uh, medic medication therapy adherence clinic for uh, enhance the enhance the services of pharmacy during the pandemic. We call it INATTI or Indonesia Test, Trace and Isolation to help the government to uh, tightening or to strengthening the, the treatment, trace and uh, also test uh, strategy to uh, enhance the uh, pandemic uh, COVID-19 handling in Indonesia. And we see here the, the mapping of the application uh, like telemedicine, but this is uh, more uh, telemedicine with pharmacists and also involved with the medical doctor there. And we see that uh, here uh, during this, uh, this pandemic, we still has a communication with, uh, with the patient, with the IT, uh, and then also with the uh, services is uh, interprofessional collaboration here. There is some hypnosis also, there is some uh, pharmacies, and then also some uh, medical doctor there. And then uh, we see the, the, the patient uh, virtually uh, with this application. And then the, this is very good help enough to uh, maybe to help the uh, the hospital uh, to uh, assist the patient in uh, self um, self isolation in in home. Uh, they have the safe uh, the safe methodology for self isolation, uh, and then also to uh, yeah to decline the number of the uh, family uh, like a family cluster during the self-isolation. And then also we, we provide the live chat uh, to provide the service to consult uh, of the consulta consultation of the patient and the, and the family. 
to know how to do or how to not to do during their uh, uh, self-isolation. Uh, thank you. Maybe there is the rules of uh, the rules of the uh, pharmacists in Indonesia during our uh, pandemic activity, especially to enhance the number of vaccination in Indonesia. Uh, thank you again for your kind attention. And then thank you for the Swipe RX and the committee for the good arrangement of this webinar. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Professor Kerry, for explaining the differences of the different vaccines used for COVID-19, as well as high, uh, heightening the importance of uh, combating misinformation about vaccines, about different vaccines. It's very, very rampant now. And thank you also for sharing the updates about the how, my, how your country is uh, doing well when it comes to combating this pandemic. Thank you very much, Professor Kerry. Thank you, Mikey. Now for our fourth speaker from Cambodia, she graduated her bachelor's degree in pharmacy in the University of Health Sciences, Cambodia. Her most recent experience include being a simulation teacher at the UHS and an officer at Chaktumuk Referral Hospital. Let's all welcome Ms. Kim Srey Tok. Yes, hello, everybody. Hello. Good evening, everybody, and including all pharmacists, all beloved pharmacists, because I'm also a pharmacist as well. Today, I'm really happy to join with Swap08 on the topic so um, I let me share me share you my screen. Yes. Did you hear me? Yes. On topic unlock pharmacy's potential role in contribution of. of successful COVID-19 combating and vaccination rollout in Cambodia. I'm here to share information, all information in terms of my experience and combating uh, of COVID-19 in and vaccination rollout in Cambodia. First, I would like to introduce a little bit of me. My name is Kam and I am a hospital pharmacist at Tatamuk Referral Hospital. I am um, also a simulation lecturer at University of Health and Science. And now I'm working for COVID-19 vaccine management system officer. First, everyone, please look, take a look at uh, COVID-19 update in Cambodia. This report was yesterday. New case was a uh, six hundred fifty-five and recover one uh, recover for forty hundred uh, forty hundred people. And new cases uh, yesterday from abroad abroad is uh, seventy-two and total of death four hundred ninety four hundred nine. 93, but uh, new is uh, just 18. Total cases uh, of yesterday is uh, 45,366. 45, okay, and here, this is a uh, this is a COVID-19 vaccination progress report integrated with the Ministry of National Defense in Cambodia. Um, please uh, notice that we start vaccination from 10 February. Um, now, uh, today is 24. So this uh, report is uh, just uh, last two days from starting vaccination 
until to uh, 22 June. We already vaccinated 35.18% of target population. In Cambodia, we have target uh, vaccination. We, uh, we will inject vaccine for 10 million people. It's equal 60.6% of all population in Cambodia. Based on um, report at 2019, there are 16.49 million people in Cambodia. So if we inject 10 million population, we inject vaccine for 10 million population, we will get 60.6% uh, uh, of all population. Next. Um, vaccination report on April 2018. I'm really proud of my country. Um, I just uh, researched and I got uh, this uh, report from uh, COVID-19 vaccination in Asian member country. Cambodian went second in Asian as the country that vaccinated more people against COVID-19. Please see the chart. Here, um, Cambodian uh, vaccinate around 12.40% as a second rank. And Singapore is the first rank, 37.48%. After Indonesia, next Malaysia, Laos, Myanmar, Thai, and Philippines, Brunei, Vietnam. Vietnam. Vietnam is 0.27%. Okay, now um, we all just see this report before, but uh, in this slide, I just want to review, com review vaccination for the whole country. The whole country, for first dose, we already inject around 3.5 million people, and second dose, we already inject. 2.7 million people is uh, uh, around 35%. After that, I will specify only in big city. Uh, it is Phnom Penh. Here, uh, data of vaccination in Phnom Penh. There are more district, uh, more than uh, more than in the table. Uh, there, in the table, there are only eight districts that uh, we get vaccination number from the different ministry and district administration. In those districts, we have 1.3 million people and we vaccinate 1, 1 million people already. It's equal to 75.7%. It is uh, a significant successful of vaccination. Now, I would like to share uh, you uh, what we did and what we are doing on this. Um, it is a government vaccination plan. Um, each country uh, has different master plan in vaccination. The same as uh, we live in different country, we have different culture. For Cambodia, we prioritize. We inject uh, for frontline officer first, and then high right group. People live in capital city, Phnom Penh, and the last one is countryside. Uh, we have 24 province. You can see uh, the picture. Frontline officer, there are police, doctor, Pharmacist, other healthcare provider, and army, and this is patient. Um, this is army. So we inject them first, and after uh, we we in, uh, we vaccinate to senior citizen outbreak zone and all staff working in the ministry. And for countryside, uh, you can read. Uh, there are many provinces, but uh, we also prioritize as much as we can. Uh, we, are, we 
We prioritize some province where the outbreak happening, such as Kandah, Prasenu province, Simriya, Pumpungcham, extra. In the picture, I would like to uh, introduce you that this is a map of Phnom Penh, and we categorize into three zones: one yellow zone, and two orange zone, and three red zone. Yellow zone is safe zone. The orange zone is um, there. There is some cases. Uh, there is few cases of COVID nineteen, and red zone is the uh, outbreak zone. So. Yeah, you should not go to at uh, should not go to the red zone. At uh, the right picture near the left uh, near the this one is uh, the set, the map of Phnom Penh as well. But after we quarantine fourteen day, this picture I got from Ministry of Information uh, on Facebook. You can search it. Uh, on 27 April and after quarantine, the uh, most of area become yellow zone. Here before red zone and now yellow zone. The, this picture uh, report on 12 May. Now um, we talk about vaccination process in Phnom Phnom Penh, which is a capital city of Cambodia, has totally 14 districts and cover 2.28 million citizens. In order to provide the vaccination to such a large population in a faster way, we are increasing until 182 vaccination center in Phnom Penh. And Ministry of Health stated that Phnom Penh vaccination campaign will be finished this month, June. Actually, we just finished uh, yesterday, uh, 23rd. Yes, we finished first dose because of the progress has been faster than planted. Um, however, uh, we finished first dose and some, however, some place we already finished second dose. So, who are the main players who give the vaccine to community? There are three things of vaccination. First, Ministry of Health, second, uh, they are volunteers, but there are also healthcare providers that study about medicine or something like that. In here, uh, data vaccine in Phnom Penh from 18 February to 20 yesterday. Here, uh, we have three types of vaccine available in Cambodia, such as Sinopharm, COVID cell or AstraZeneca and Sinovac. We uh, total yesterday uh, of around 1.3 million doses, uh, same as 1.3 vaccine. So we already inject uh, vaccine uh, many people. And this is a report from my Hospital reported of Jatamok Hospital from uh, the uh, starting vaccination on 19 February until yesterday. Um, my hospital vaccinated 32,698 people.
Hello. Yes. Uh, welcome back. So this slide we contribute successful COVID nineteen combating and healing faster by three main action. First, precaution. Second, vaccination. And third, lockdown. Now it's our turn. Um, what are potential role of pharmacies? Um, as mentioned uh, about, not only vaccination down, are both contributing in helping the body heal faster. So what will pharmacies do to participate in COVID-19 successful vaccination rolling out in the country as mentioned about? Yes, uh, in my experience, I manage stock of COVID-19 medicine. Uh, it's mainly cell medicine for urgent need. Um, as simple and antacid like paracetamol, antihistamine. In here, we use cetirizine mostly. Mycolytic, we use promycin, eight milligram, and vitamin C extra. Um, for medicine, are the main uh, medicine. Um, now we have another COVID nineteen mission. It is called house treatment. We arrange a uh, doctor and nurse to uh, treat people who get COVID-19, uh, who stay at home. So uh, they bring medicine and we involve uh, by uh, research medicine or, or prepare medicine for them to give uh, directly to the patient. And second, uh, we, we have to follow and promote Ministry of Health guideline or government strategy. Um, government strategy is here. Yep, this slide is government strategy. First, we uh, uh, cannot uh, inject for uh, the second, the second or, th or third priority or third people. We have to follow government by inject a vaccine for frontline officer only. And next, we have to advise patients on how to protect themselves even those that already get vaccine. Three do and three done. And motivating the community who has who hesitate to get vaccine. Some people still uh, don't want get vaccine uh, because of some curious, but we have uh, to inspire them to get vaccine as a, to get vaccine as a mention. We have schedule and uh, especially uh, we have specific schedule on district. So we have to motivate them to go on time. And one more, I, uh, involved in many COVID-19 in mission such as quarantine mission, vaccination mission, and RT. RT it means urgent response team. RT is a team uh, that deliver, deliver or send patients who get uh, COVID-19 positive to stay at hospital uh, from the house or the uh, hotel to hospital. Um, RT responsible for delivering only. And quarantine mission, um, you all, um, all participant and all uh, speaker, if you come to Cambodia, you may be meet me because you have to quarantine 14 days and I will go to check your health and your temperature. Um, every day until you get uh, COVID-19 negative. And I also uh, working for vaccination mission. Now, uh, one more. As a pharmacist, we have to make vaccine. Stop organizing, separate and control. Stop. We have to stock medicine with the right temperature, like 
uh, Dr. Kerry mentioned uh, at uh, two to eight uh, Celsius and the crisis. And one more thing I uh, want to add is about refrigerator. If you stop vaccine in refrigerator, please look at refrigerator guidelines. Some refrigerator has limitation uh, of stock. So we cannot uh, stop over the limitation. If we stop more and more vaccine uh, over limitation, our vaccine may be die. So no efficacy. And uh, um, for organizing, we have to organize vaccine for first dose and second dose. We have to prepare for uh, people who already get first uh, vaccine and uh, reserve second dose. If we, if we don't organize, some people who already got first dose cannot get second dose separate. For separate, currently, my hospital separate um, medicine and organ organize medicine for health center and other vaccine center to inject uh, vaccine for population at uh, their zone. Now we don't, um, we don't have, uh, I mean that uh, now we are stalker, now we are the uh, separator. We don't uh, inject vaccine for people of um, Cambodian citizen. Um, one more thing, uh, control. We have to control uh, we have to control uh, vaccine. It means that um, some vaccine, uh, we, some, some vaccine, we uh, cannot, cannot inject uh, for second dose with different place. Uh, if they come to uh, my hospital, we inject a uh, a uh, second dose for them only. If uh, they come from another place, we cannot inject uh, for them. Uh, but uh, there is a little exception. And the last one is um, being a pharmacist, I participate in IT sector. I never, I never expect that I uh, working in uh, IT sector because um, I just learned from uh, my university and I know about medicine, about uh, stock, blah, blah, blah. But about IT, I never learned about it. Now I do more than what I used to do. I am a, a COVID-19 vaccine management system officer. So I have, I have user to use a vaccination mobile app. I uh, put my email and password into uh, the system and I can get uh, get access and then I uh, register for the patient uh, for all information all their information into the system. This uh, working uh, we work to uh, facilitate vaccination process completely and faster. Here, when you uh, get vaccination in Cambodia, you will get COVID-19 vaccination card. And uh, QR code here, uh, it um, include all information, all information that I uh, register for you. So it is useful, useful for you to use this card to travel anyway, anywhere. Last, lastly, it is uh, my picture of a uh, mission, quarantine mission. Here, um, we are, uh, we were writing report and um, the last one is um, we, we are doing for quarantine people. Vaccination for vaccination mission, miss for vaccination. Sorry, for vaccination mission, 
um, even though I am a pharmacist, but I also participate in uh, vaccinate, vaccinate uh, I'm sorry. All those, uh, I am a pharmacist. Um, I also uh, participate in inject vaccine. In my country, pharmacists cannot uh, inject uh, any medicine. We only um, we only uh, cooperate with doctor and we uh, work with medicine, but we don't have any role in injects. But uh, I learn from my hospital and uh, I inject uh, just a little case uh, in terms of lacking of um, worker, sometimes, just sometimes. And here, um, the activity of um, of us that uh, we are all introducing information of patient into COVID-19 management system. Here, the last one uh, is the picture uh, come from your card here, your card. When you scan, when you scan a QR code, you will receive this. Your information, your ID, vaccine, and a second dose, first dose that that you inject a uh, vaccine. Mm. Do you know uh, she is uh, the second winner? Um, our government offer prize for people who uh, get vaccine at a specific number. Uh, she is uh, the second, maybe second, yes, maybe second million people who get vaccine. So she got uh, around $1,000 from our government. Yes, lastly, thank you for your listening and thank you for Swipe OX. Yes, uh, Akon. All right, thank you very much, Mom Kim, for explaining the statistics of now the, of what's happening in the current pandemic. No, it's, it's really nice to see that um, despite the effort, no, when you see it visually on a pie chart that um, Singapore is doing really their best to vaccinate all their people and as, as other Asian countries follow. And it's also nice that you've mentioned the, let's say, flow chart of what's happening there. You said um, pre precaution, um, vaccination, then lockdown. That's what's happening, I think, in Cambodia right now. And upon uh, on reflecting it on the difference in the Philippines, what happened with us was um, lockdown, precaution, then vaccination. So I guess it's time to think about the um, errors or think about outside the box when it comes to um, assessing this uh, pandemic. Now, um, once again, thank you very much to our speakers. Let's proceed to our question and answer portion. Now, for our first question, this is for Sir Brian Posadas. All right. So, um, regarding immunizing pharmacists, where will be the actual training be done? Okay, because we are in pandemic, no. What we're currently doing is. The didactics, no, the lecture, ta the lecture, the concepts, uh, these are all taught using Zoom platform. And the skills assessment and skills training, we are also using Zoom platform where there is a demonstration and return demonstration online. Except that, of course, when they do their re return demonstration, it's also via Zoom. So they're doing it on their own in their respective homes. No? And then they'll go through a skills assessment also online. Uh, after they pass the three levels of training, that's the time we uh, let them uh, have a face-to-face -face skills assessment. We uh, allow them to choose the physician and or an immunizing pharmacist near their area 
where they are practicing. So at least uh, it's more, I don't know, because of the limitation of the quarantines. No? Those who are near their, their area is basically the ones who are assessing them on their final skills assessment. But everything is happening online. Only that part of uh, skills assessment, the level four, happens uh, face to face. I see. Thank you very much, Sir Brian. I guess that was a Filipino who was asking. No? Um, if you have any other questions with regards to the immunizing pharmacy program, you can always check the Philippine Pharmacists Association Facebook, Facebook page. So there are updates there on when and how to enroll this um, immunizing pharmacy program. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, sir. We'll Ryan. have our batch five, Mikey, by the way, on July 5. So oh, see, yes, that's uh, good. You want to still join the batch five. A uh, batch okay. six, sorry. Okay, so we have we have ongoing batches now for Filipinos who want mm -hmm. to help their community by becoming immunizing pharmacists. The door is always open for the Philippine Pharmacists Association. Thank you very much, Sir Brian. So um, we have another question here. So I guess this is for everyone. How do you encounter those public who is demanding their preferred vaccine? Yes, uh, that is very, very common because we have different perceptions on vaccines. So I guess we could start with um, Malaysia. Sir Professor Haniki? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, well, the, the way that we try to convince uh, our citizen is that the available vaccine is the supposedly best vaccine for you for this current time. But given the fact that we now have few choices, we definitely would tailor it to the uh, uh, safety and suitability and also taking into consideration uh, of course the uh, efficacy. Uh, but knowing that they're all effective, that's why they are approved. We try to advocate uh, the use of uh, suitable vaccine, uh, considering the comorbidities or any other factors that would make them ineligible or more suitable for one vaccine or another. Of course, they have their preference given, uh, for example, uh, uh, maybe they have uh, read up on certain information or they receive uh, information from friends and other health professionals. But we as pharmacists can always convince them that uh, the choice or the selection of the vaccine by health professionals uh, do take into consideration these factors and uh, if they are offered, uh, should be the safest and the most suitable vaccine for them at the current time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Nick. How about uh, Professor Dr. Kerry? What's your um, opinion regarding the uh, how on people demanding a certain particular brand of vaccines? How would you convince those people? Okay, um, I think. Hello. Okay, yeah. okay. Sorry, yes. I'll off the connection. Uh, the question is this question on the no. screen. Uh, oh, this one. How do you encounter those public who is demanding their part of vaccine? Yeah, <clears throat> I think um, uh, the, the demand of the vaccine now is uh, quite big uh, due to the understanding of the people that the vaccination is important for her uh, for the heart immunity and to encounter uh, this public who is demanding the prefer uh, vaccine uh, i will say that uh, any kind of the effectivity of vaccine is cannot compare because the effectivity of vaccine is depend on the um, depend of the metabolism of each a person so i think uh, uh, but uh, all the uh, people has uh, has the right to to choose and depend on of the uh, vaccine provided in the country so i think it's okay if some uh, people want to uh, prefer some brand of the vaccine but it depend on of the um, of the 
uh, vaccine providing in the country. Indonesia now facing for just two brand, just Sinovac and AstraZeneca is already uh, is already uh, on the uh, health uh, facility in Indonesia. But in any kind of the uh, brand of the vaccine, it depends also on the emergency use of authorization of our national uh, drug agency. Why any kind of vaccine is okay, but it needs to have some registration uh, in our uh, uh, national board of the drug and uh, agency in Indonesia. Uh, that is my opinion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Kerry. Now, um, I'll 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 just choose another question so we could accommodate more questions as much as possible. No? So this is one question. No, uh, this may sound silly, but as it is a genuine concern of mine, uh, a viewer asked, for a person who has very shaky or unsteady hands and would love to be a vaccinator pharmacist, is it ideal or possible to undergo training as a vaccinator? The, uh, maybe I could answer that. No, yes, 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 uh, yes. Yes, of course. No, because when we teach uh, pharmacists how to vaccinate, that includes making the patient stable and making your hand stable before you actually administer it. So basically, what we what we do is when we administer, it's not like uh, you're doing it like this. Now, usually there's an arm. No, so you have uh, well, of course, there's an arm. So you touch the patient and then you rest this on the patient's arm. And then you administer it. So basically, the stability uh, for your arm is also coming from the patient's stability. So you, there, there are techniques for that. And mm. these things are being taught uh, in the training program. So yes, even if you have uh, shaky and steady hands, maybe th th what would be more difficult if it's really extremely shaky. Uh, it's really uh, uncontrollable. But uh, slightly shaky hands, uh, we can still work on that. Yeah, I I'm, I'm agree with Sir Brian, mm -hmm. but if the pharmacist has a tremor like that, maybe yeah. it's difficult because mm -hmm. tremor is difficult to, you know, to undergo the, the, the vaccine. Yeah. yeah, but if it is uh, slightly shaky and st or unsteady, it's okay. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Now for our next question. Could the new variant of the COVID-19 virus reduce the efficacy of the vaccine since there are very uh, numerous variants that are appearing now? So who can answer? Okay, I will try to answer. Yes, a new uh, mutation of the COVID-19 can be decline the efficacy of the vaccine. So that's why like a, a vaccine of influenza uh, each year, it is a, uh, it is uh, has a different vaccine. So we know that if we have the vaccine of influenza, it needs to revaccinate it again uh, every year. It is uh, depend of the uh, whole genome sequencing project that we can um, we can sequ sequence the the mutation of the of the virus. So I think uh, the. Uh, the variant of the, or the mutation of the COVID-19 virus also uh, can be detected in the uh, WGS project or, or uh, whole genome uh, sequencing project that also can be uh, report to the vaccine industry, uh, which is the, uh, the formula of vaccine is still effective or need to enhance with uh, other kind of formula. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there anyone who wants to answer the question? All right, so let's proceed to the next question. Is there a delayed reaction after receiving the COVID vaccine? Sometimes my, my muscle, where, they in, where, they, where the vaccine was injected, it is aching and it has been a month since I've been, since I received the last dose. So are there any delayed reactions after receiving the COVID vaccine? Yeah, this is some kind of the adverse event from the vaccination. Uh, but this is uh, like um, a light adverse event of the vaccination. 
and it is common. Yes, uh, muscle uh, inje- uh, pain at the injection site is one of the yeah. common uh, adverse effect. And if since it has persisted to a month, I mean, it would be best for you to for the uh, uh, for the person who asks is to tell the your yeah. local government or local yeah. health unit. Yeah. Agree, that, Mikey. Uh, if I may add, yes. yeah, I agree that they have to already go to their nearest health facility for it to be checked. So, what is the cause of that muscle ache, no, muscle pain? Uh, th- th- there are some factors that we need to consider. It can be because of the vaccine or because of how the vaccine was administered. Remember, if the injection site, no, where the vaccine was in- administered, like for example, if I it was injected almost near here. Uh, really higher, it could, there, there could be even shoulder injury if there is a wrong uh, technique in the injection. That's the reason why uh, the suggestion for this is the uh, patient should go to the facility for proper uh, diagnosis. So we could figure out what is the cause of this if it's really attributable to the vaccine side effect. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. For our next question, how about receiving different brands for two doses of COVID-19 vaccination? For example, the first dose, we got Sinovac, and second dose, we got AstraZeneca. Is it safe? And how about its effectiveness? I guess I can call on Professor Haniki to um, share your insights about this question on the, receiving different brands for two doses of COVID-19 vaccines. Thank you, Mikey. Um, Yes, uh, the, the WHO has issued a statement that you can combine or um, how to uh, heterologous use of vaccine. You start with uh, one brand and then you use another one. But um, it's also practiced uh, in uh, uh, several countries. And what we worry is that we do want to see further data on the effectiveness and the safety. Uh, following this uh, heterologous use of uh, different brands. Um, initial uh, statements from authori- uh, uh, body of authorities um, advocate the use given the, the fact that there are similarities in their actions, in their uh, outcomes, uh, particularly effectiveness. So uh, if the patient for some reasons uh, happen to be given a different brand. So certain combination is allowed and I think best uh, to refer to your healthcare provider and of course uh, based on uh, uh, evidence and also statements uh, supporting such practice from uh, bodies from the, for example WHO, NIH and also Ministry of Health. So such, certain practice, uh, such practice is allowed but I'm sure pharmacovigilance, again the role of pharmacists uh, is practice and our role um, in, uh, is crucial here to ensure that patients who receive a second dose from different brands uh, would then be comfort the uh, level of immunity required uh, suitable to uh, ensure that uh, they are protected. So best to double check uh, before uh, you get yourself injected with a different brand. Thank you. May I add something? Please talk. Yeah, thank you. In my uh, country regulation, uh, cannot allow to has a, a different brand on uh, two shot because uh, different brand uh, I we afraid a different kind of the vaccine characteristic, and then the efficacy and then also the safety of the clinical trials. Uh, it is depend of one brand with two shot or one breath with one shot. So I think uh, uh, due to of this uh, clinical trial, that we know the dose effective about the uh, vaccine, it is uh, uh, from the clinical trial of each brand. So I think uh, the doses and then the effectivity and the safety of the clinical trial is uh, each brand is very different. Uh, so in our country, in Indonesia, uh, uh, apologize that uh, we cannot uh, do the second vaccination with different brand. Thank you. How about Mom Kim? Do you have any more to add? Yes. In uh, my opinion, 
uh, if you have different type of vaccine uh, to get, uh, you should suspend at least three months. Based on WHO guideline, if you want to get new vaccine, new type of vaccine, you have to wait until three months. Yep, I just uh, have this one. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, Sir Brian, do you have anything to add? Well, uh, maybe ha, I agree with uh, Professor Kerry. It depends on uh, each country's regulation based on the analysis of the task group, different task groups in charge of it. But basically, we have to understand that uh, when, when this vaccine went under trials, they go on a certain protocol. And the stability and, and the effectiveness really depends on uh, based on that trial. So we have to fix, uh, no, no, stick to that. Uh, unless uh, for some uh, unforeseen circumstances where the, vac the next dose is really not available, but as much as possible, you stick with what uh, your brand is. And it's actually not with the brand. Uh, something that, that has to be corrected in the mindset of people is it's not about the brand. Every vaccine would work in training and activating your immune system. So regardless of whatever brand you are taking, as much as possible, you take the same brand. But whatever vaccine is available, approved in your country, that would exhibit an effect that it would prevent severe COVID-19. So any vaccine would do. So don't be picky about the uh, brand. Don't deliberately change another brand so you get best of both worlds. Now, that's not how it goes. You should train your, uh, you should activate your immune system based on the clinical trials initially uh, presented. All right. Thank you very much, everyone who answered. For our next question, are we required or do we need to be vaccinated by another COVID vaccine brand? If we were initially vaccinated with, for example, Sinovac, since there are countries who don't acknowledge people who are vaccinated with Sinovac, I guess they're asking, let's say there are certain countries who are only acknowledging certain um, specific brands of vaccines. So um, how do you respond to this question? Let's start with Mom Kim. Actually, this is very, very common because, for example, in certain countries, they are only requiring, um, let's say, Moderna or Pfizer. They, they need those kinds of vaccines in order to enter those countries. So um, I guess the question would be, after the first COVID vaccine, vaccination on a certain brand, how long should they wait? On how on or how long should they wait uh, for them to have another brand of uh, vaccine since they don't acknowledge, for example, uh, the brand stated on the question? Oh yes, I got it. Um, normally, um, we all can get uh, any vaccine. They accept because our vaccine. Um, were approved by WHO, so they accept uh, already. You can get a uh, vaccine, you know what as mentioned, uh, for first dose and then second dose at twenty uh, first day, uh, twenty one uh, count from first day, and you can get a uh, second dose. And after that, if you want to get another vaccine, you really can just um, wait until. Um, they save time interval uh, for Sinovac, maybe six months, AstraZeneca six months, and Sinopharm, um, maybe three months. So um, after that, you can get any other vaccine. As uh, we know all together, uh, like um, flu or cold vaccine, we have a uh, one year duration only. Next year, we have to inject new. So it's the same, the same protocol. Yep. All right. Thank you. Are there any more who wants uh, to Mikey, add? if I may add. Uh, uh, maybe, okay, to answer that question um, on a practical side of it, uh, if you really have to go to that country where the country specifically 
uh, identifies only the brand of vaccine that should be allowed to their country. We have to respect their uh, laws. No? Uh, those laws were implemented based on the analysis of their experts. So whether we like it or not, if you have really, you really have to go to that country, then we abide by it. Uh, there are just, uh, as, as mentioned by Kim, a number of months that you would uh, I don't know, have to wait. But another, on, on a practical side of it, uh, the, the, the supply is scarce. So uh, being, being mindful of others, uh, don't force yourself to get another vaccine of another dose because there are a lot of people who are waiting to get vaccinated, whatever is available. So uh, unless it's really critical that you have to go to that country, that's the time you may consider uh, and consult with your healthcare professionals. But nonetheless, you, you should not worry about it. And if you just want to get vaccinated because you want these two doses, let's be mindful of others. A lot of our kababa, a lot of uh, our country, you know, uh, countrymen, no? also wants to get vaccinated. So let's give it to them. If you already have the Sinovac vaccine, Sinopharm, whatever it is that is already given to you, stick with it already. Uh, be be uh, thankful that you already have that vaccine. And just avoid going to that country first, no? where, where your vaccine is not accepted because we don't have much choice. It's not even readily available. You cannot purchase. You cannot choose because it is run by the government. It is controlled by the government. So let's just, uh, again, no? mindfulness. It's what's important at this time of pandemic. Yeah. yeah. Very wise, Sir Brian. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Brian. Yeah. Yes, I got your point. Uh, Miss uh, Doctor, uh, but um, as uh, I mentioned about, in case they are have low immunization, so uh, they have to repair or get new vaccination. Uh, yes, uh, your speak is uh, really good that we have to share vaccine to another country or poor country. Yes, but um, I, I I just want to ask uh, the answer of uh. uh I want. I just want to answer all the question that I want to ask if uh, they can inject a second dose or another a uh, brand of vaccination vaccine or not. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So for the benefit of our time, as much as I want to ask all the questions of our participants, we have to narrow it to one last question. So, so this question is for all the uh, speakers. So. Many were afraid to get to vaccinated as they were saying that the vaccines were made at a very, very short period of time. In short, it was very made fast. It was rapidly available. How could we convince those people? So we could start with Professor Kerry. How would you convince your people to be vaccinated? Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned before, it is common in every vaccination, some hesitancy comes or goes to the population. But in terms of pandemic, we must to, uh, consider that the vaccination is not for the safety or for this or for the for the uh, you know for the importance of the uh, saving life of uh, uh, he or herself. But the vaccination during the pandemic is for the heart immunity, for for healing the world, for healing the country. So that's why. Uh, we try to make some uh, many propaganda to educate people that it is not just the vaccination itself, but it is also for the humanity, for the human being. Thank you. Something like that. Thank you very much, but Professor it is, Kerry. It, 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 is, it is not easy, but we try to make some uh, promotion and propaganda like that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, Dr. Kerry. Yes. How about you, Professor Nick? What, uh, how, can, what, how can you convince the people to get vaccinated? Yeah, uh, I always tell my students and of course uh, other healthcare professionals, in God we trust, others we need data. So uh, all these clinical trials that we, uh, had been conducted uh, with rigorous um, uh, requirements and given the circumstance that we are in a pandemic and emergency situation, uh, also taken into consideration that the prior knowledge that we have on vaccine production and also dealing with uh, certain uh, coronavirus. Remember, even in Malaysia, we had the Nipah virus uh, and we had the, the, the uh, capacity and the knowledge. 
and also the sharing of countries. For example, China, when they uh, first started to have this pandemic and then the, uh, the sequencing of the viral genome and then the sharing of it and then the technology and then of course the support, uh, many factors came into place uh, to ensure that uh, vaccines are produced uh, quickly, but uh, adhering to the rigorous scientific regime and protocol to ensure a safety, a effectiveness, and also quality. And that is also screened through by individual countries' uh, regulatory body, for example, National Pharmaceutical Regulatory Agent Agency in Malaysia. Uh, again, looking at the data, also conducting studies, uh, additional studies to strengthen the data that we have on vaccines. So the time frame that uh, we have on the production is not necessarily short, but it's just expedited given the urgency of the situation. And also coupled with the support, it can, uh, which comes in many forms, financial, technology sharing, prior knowledge, infrastructure, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, don't worry in terms of quality uh, and safety. Uh, the products are uh, suitable to be used. And we also have the pharmacovigilance, as I mentioned just now. All countries have that in place to ensure uh, the phase four uh, continues uh, many, many years beyond uh, the introduction of vaccines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Nick. How about Mam Kim? What, how would you convince your countrymen to undergo vaccination? I'm sorry, my internet is slow. Can you ask again? Okay. Um, the question is, um, since all the vaccines were somehow rushed and most uh, people are hesitant about taking the vaccine, how would you convince them to undergo vaccination? Okay, I got it. First, we have to show that uh, the safety of the vaccine by mentioning the good difference for the example, example, uh, Cambodian people, uh, first, uh, mostly they don't trust on Sinopharm. And uh, now they are all uh, uh, trust uh, Sinopharm because the Sinopharm has uh, introduced into uh, safety use uh, in the WHO. So uh, you, we can convince them by um, mention a uh, popular reference or uh, like WHO, CDC. Yes, second, we have to uh, inject uh, vaccine uh, first. As healthcare provider or pharmacist, I have to inject vaccine and I show them that I already inject, I have no any problem. Yeah, and they all uh, can get vaccine, uh, get vaccine, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, you have to get any dangerous uh, get vaccine to get our health uh, strong. Uh, it means that we cannot get severe disease or uh, un or uh, like uh, Dr. Regan already mentioned uh, at presentation. Yes, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mom Kim. And last but not the least, Sir Brian, how would you convince your countrymen? Okay, uh, I always believe that people perish due to lack of knowledge. So basically, to combat that, we just have to educate them. As a pharmacist, let's try no, uh, to simplify how we explain the concept of immunology to our patients because it's a complex uh, topic. If we try to explain it very technical to a lay people or a lay person, that would be really difficult for them to understand. But simply, let's put it at, at, at this uh, an, an, uh, context. Uh, educating them means letting them understand in the simplest way possible. So to alleviate those fears, like for example, this was hurriedly done. Uh, yes, this was fast, but there's no cutting corners that happened. Uh, the number of... Uh, samples or the patients uh, involved in the trial are the same. The control procedures were also the same. So there's no shortcut. There's no cutting corners. It still went to the, through the process. And we know not everything on clinical trials now goes to the production or being approved for emergency use authorization of the country. So once 
the regulatory bodies already released emergency use authorization that already proves that this has passed the clinical safety trials. And as a pharmacist, we know how tedious the process is. So we really have to boost the confidence of uh, the public by explaining it to them in the simplest way possible and reminding them that, uh, again, vaccine can help their immune system. At the end of the day, it's still their immune system responding to the vaccine that would spell the difference. So they have to still practice all the protocols as mandated by the government. But at the end of the day, don't give false hope that you will never get COVID vaccine just because you're vaccinated. Let's be truthful to that fact. And again, always go back to the benefit outweighing the risk. I guess uh, as a pharmacist, we are very much knowledgeable in how to do this. We're doing this for all other medications. We know all other medications that they're taking not just this vaccine, who can potentially have adverse events. And that's the purpose why we are uh, here in the community, in the society. We have to uh, manage this potential adverse events. Thank you very much to all our speakers for those uh, for imparting very, very, very good insights with regards to the current pandemic. No? And reminders to our participants on how to get their certificates. <clears throat> Swipe RX will send an email to those who have spent a minimum of 45 minutes in the webinar. The participants with less than 45 minutes will not receive a certificate. You are required to fill out the feedback form by clicking the link provided in the email. Make sure that you have a Swipe RX account. Make sure that you are connected to a stable internet network while answering the feedback form. Do not leave or close the Swipe RX app. Closing or leaving the app while answering the feedback form will be marked as a failed attempt. There is no score requirement to get the certificate. You just need to complete the feedback form. You will get the certificate within 48 hours after completing the form. If there are any questions that you can ask or any question that may arise, or for more information, you can email us hello at swiperxapp.com. So, once again, I would like to thank everyone who participated with us, who stayed, who stayed with us up to the very end of this webinar series. Thank you yeah. for staying tuned in Swipe RX app. Now, take note that all of the brands that we associated here, we mentioned here, we are not endorsing of any kind. We are not tearing down any kind of vaccine of any brand mentioned. Okay, take note of that. So, once again, I, I wish you all to stay healthy and be enthusiastic. Brian. Brian, can we take a photo, please, before everyone uh, is uh, leaving and closing this uh, webinar? Sure, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think this is thank a very... Thank you, everyone. And especially yeah. this oh, like, Yep, thank you. Okay. Uh, I think perhaps need to, yeah, open all of the uh, video from everyone. I just want to take this opportunity as a very um, interesting and uh, also very knowledgeable uh, session uh, from us all to hear from all of you, uh, the experts from uh, all over uh, the uh, country, from the Southeast Asia. I think this is really interesting to understand how can we as a pharmacist uh, taking the role, not only as a professional, but also above uh, that all is also for humanity, right? As uh, And also, uh, I like what Professor Kerry, as well as uh, all the speakers here, and also Professor Nikki, that says that in God we trust, but for others uh, in data that we should also put our trust in, right? Okay, so... Uh, um, Thank you very much for uh, staying. I think we are over for more than about 25 minutes. It shows that the high uh, enthusiasm from all of the uh, participants from uh, uh, today's uh, webinar. So maybe we can take a photo, uh, first screen. Yeah, uh, everyone can uh, open their um, uh, video uh, setting, right? So let me uh, take uh, one, okay. So uh, first screen done, wait, um, second screen, um, okay, great, okay, 
And then, uh, wait, next, if we can see also. All right, third screen done. Okay, thank you very much, uh, all of the uh, moderators, speakers, participants, all the committee that is involved in this very lovely uh, evening. Uh, hope that there are a lot of benefits, there are a lot of knowledge that we can apply in our uh, daily uh, activity. So by this, I think we can officially close this. Uh, have a wonderful evening, have a wonderful rest. And um, see you again on the next <laughs> webinar from SwiperX. Thanks. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you so very much, much everyone. Thank you. Again. Thank, Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for organizing this. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.